damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, guys, on the line, I've got the great Gareth Porter. He writes, well, first of all, he wrote the book Perils of Dominance about Vietnam and Manufactured Crisis about the Iranian nuclear program. He writes regularly for the American Conservative Magazine for Truth Out and Truth Dig, and we reprint just about all of it at antiwar.com. This one, I think, was from Truth Out. Um, it's called Bolton is Spinning Israeli Intelligence to push for war against Iran. And of course, intelligence is in ironic quotes there. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Gareth? I'm doing fine, thanks. But just a quick correction. Uh, it was truth dig, not truth out. Okay. Yeah, strike <laughs> that, that was... reverse it. I get it confused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Hey, man. So, uh, yeah, John Bolton is our uh, national security advisor, P President Trump's national security advisor, so that's bad. Um and uh, so just to review the actual facts here for a second, um, John Bolton had announced on Sunday that the USS Abraham Lincoln uh, carrier battle group, I guess, was deploying yep. to the region in order to uh, check some Iranian threat against U.S. forces in the region. But then that much wasn't even true, right? The ship was on its way anyway, and he decided yep. to characterize <laughs> it like that. What else isn't true was, here? Yeah, the ship was already in the Mediterranean. And by the way, it turns out that it was already planned to rotate it to the Persian Gulf. They simply uh, they sped up the the, uh, the rotation to, to the Gulf. But anyway, okay, so they it sped was, it up a little bit. So there's something there. There was a kernel of truth to it. But <laughs> so what about the threat that uh, the group was preempting there? Yeah, that, that's really the story here. That's the major point of my article, that, that what's going on here, uh, and, and it really needs to be understood clearly uh, that, that this is a plot by uh, John Bolton, uh, which was started last fall. I mean, his, his big uh, strategy was, was undertaken originally last fall with the full cooperation of Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, um, and that was to um, use a um, the a few mortar shells or, or rockets that were fired uh, first of all in the vicinity, uh, broadly speaking, uh, in the broad vicinity, and I'm talking about a kilometer away from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad in the Green Zone, uh, and uh, a, a couple of other shells that fell um, in the vicinity of the Basra Airport. Um, and they they used that to suggest that Iran was using proxy forces to threaten U.S. diplomats and therefore, you know, issued a warning that henceforth the United States will retaliate directly against Iran for any move by its proxy forces to threaten U.S. interests in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And now a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, was uh, Jason Ditz at news.antiwar.com had it that the same group that had fired at the American mission there in Basra had also attacked an Iranian uh, mission there, whatever exactly you call it, in well, Basra, because they were blaming the Iranians for a lot of their local uh, economic problems and this kind of thing, because Iran does have a lot of sway in that part of Iraq, of course. And so the same group that was protesting against America and apparently launched a mortar shell or whatever it was, did the same thing over 
at the Iranian mission too. But the way they have it is, hey, any Shia with a rifle in Iraq is an Iranian-backed special group or whatever. I think that's correct, that it, that it was indeed far more likely. I, mean, I don't think there was ever any acceptance of responsibility by anybody, but undoubtedly, uh, you know, the motive there was uh, indicated that it was probably very likely those forces that were anti-Iranian who were very upset about the fact that Basra had lost its electricity because Iran was demanding that they pay their bills. And uh, so so this was part of a broader protest mm-hmm. against Iran. That's and right. then the other thing was Bolton took this opportunity to demand that the Pentagon deliver some refreshed war plans in case we decided we, in case he convinced Trump to retaliate. Well, that's right. But before we get to that point, let me just bring it up to date. This I'm describing what happened last September uh, when when Bolton then went to the Pentagon and said, I want some military options to retaliate against Iran. And the Pentagon was not happy about that. I mean, the people there don't want to get into a war with Iran. And, and so they uh, Mattis was, of course, still secretary of defense. And he he and his people were not happy about this. But apparently they delivered uh, at least one or two options, but made it clear that they were opposed to any retaliation. And uh, now, according to The New York Times, just this week, that opposition did, in fact, quash any uh, further move in that direction at the time. But then now, of course, you have Mattis gone uh, and Bolton is going on his merry way. And and so what he's done now is to uh, basically take advantage of uh, the situation to add yet another element to this threat to retaliate against any proxy, uh, alleged proxy attack on American interests. And that is to say the United States will now um, retaliate militarily against Iran for any proxy attack, not only against American interests, but any interests of an ally of the United States. States in the Middle East. In so other in other words, words, if the Houthis get off a lucky shot at the Saudis, that would count? Exactly. Precisely so. In and the of middle course, of a war, when we all know that Iran hardly backs the Houthis at all, maybe they pay them some money every once in a while. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly, you know, what the degree of Iranian involvement is, but in any case, uh, you know, they're, they're saying very clearly that any attack by the Houthis, or for that matter, uh, you know, Hamas uh, uh, firing rockets at, at Israel hmm. will now What be- about if Hezbollah attacks Al-Qaeda in the Idlib province? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we're going <laughs> to see that, but who knows how they can spin things. So this is, this is enormously broadening the range of possibilities for Bolton and his allies to try to get into a military confrontation with Iran. That mm-hmm. is the most dangerous situation we have faced thus far. And and what I'm concerned about is not just that, that Bolton is going ahead with that, but that there is no apparent opposition from any major power center in Washington, whether it's Congress, the media, or uh, the, the bureaucracy. And so we're really in the soup now. Hey, y'all, quick note about a couple of upcoming events. I'm going to Childerberg, which is at, I think, what, Lake Buchanan? Coming up uh, June 8th and 9th. Just Google search up the Childerberg there, and you'll find it. If you're in the Texas Hill Country or somewhere in Central Texas or, I guess, anywhere, uh, come on out, and uh, it's going to be a big camp out and fun time out there at Childerberg, June 8th and 9th. And then also... I'm doing Pork Fest in New Hampshire. That's on June the 12th, just a couple days later there. And I'm going to be sharing a stage with Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center, the great stand-up comedian and libertarian uh, podcast host, Dave Smith, as well as Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future Freedom Foundation, who I'm trying to convince to run for president of the United States as a Libertarian Party candidate. So that should be a lot of fun. Childerberg, June 8th and 9th, and Pork Fest on June 12th with Michael Bolden, Dave Smith, and Jacob Hornberger, too. Well, so, yeah, this New York Times report says they had a big uh, principals meeting of the National Security Council, which included the chiefs, and 
Is that all we have now is to pray that the standing army is here to check the passions of the civilian elected leadership? That well, maybe actually, they will say, hey, we don't want to do this because look at how many guys we have. Thousands and thousands of guys we have within range in Afghanistan and in Kuwait and certainly hundreds, if not thousands in Iraq, probably thousands in Iraq. And plus all of the assets in the Persian Gulf that are within range, the Qatar Air Force Base and the Bahrain Fifth yep. Fleet Navy Base and all of these interests. I mean, you can't move that stuff out of the way, can you? That's right, exactly. And, and I think I think you were precisely on target when you raised that to, to identify the, the military services as the best hope, the only hope that we have left at this point without any you know further organizing by opposition people to raise a stink and, and get to put pressure on people in Congress and so forth. That's the best hope that we have. And that's because uh, Mattis is gone, replaced by Patrick Shanahan, who appears to be a yes man, not interested in trying to oppose any uh, initiative by Bolton. Um, and uh, the the what used to be, I mean, back in the Bush era, when you had uh, CENTCOM uh, commander Fox Fallon, who was uh, very much opposed to war with Iran or even getting into a position where there was a risk of such a war. Now you have somebody, uh, General McKenzie, who appears to be quite willing to go out uh, with, with the warmongers and take all those risks. Um, so, you know, I think that we are indeed, uh, f we're going to have to fall back, at least for this moment, on the hope that um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff will be sufficiently alarmed by this that they will, in fact, uh, take action to leak to the press, to go public with their opposition to uh, uh, to a warmongering and and you know provocative actions by the United States. But thus far, it hasn't happened, and that's that's quite alarming. Um, so so I, I think we are we are in a situation where the possibilities for uh, blocking this are not uh, nearly as strong as they were under George W. Bush. Man. And, you know, especially even after in the era where everybody knows it was Trump that left the Iran deal, it wasn't the Iranians. And that, you know, all this provocation, you know, back then they had this whole narrative that they had built up that there's a nuclear weapons program in Iran there's civilian one that's safeguarded. But if you point out that it's safeguarded, then no, I think maybe there's a secret one there where they're making a nuclear yeah. bomb. And if you're not impressed by that, how about every time a Shiite kills an American in Iraq War II, they're now claiming 600. I think it was more like five. But uh, out of the 4,500 guys that died there, about 500 of them were killed by Shia. But that means, according to Pompeo, they were killed by Iran. That was the story back then. Right. As it was happening. And so if Cheney, this is the first time I interviewed you famously in January 2007, when they launched the surge and Bush blamed all our problems in Iraq War II on Iran in his famous speech from the library there. You came on the show, well, you wrote an article about it, and I interviewed you about it, saying, everybody, calm down. If they do attack, it's not going to be till the end of the spring, beginning of the summer, because of Condoleezza Rice made this statement to a few important reporters at the State Department where she explained this and that. And so, uh, don't get too carried away and all of that. But still, in other words, though, what I'm trying to say, though, is they had all this momentum behind it, whereas here, there's no real momentum I mean, I guess the media will go along with any crazy thing that Bolton cooks up. Why not? They love it. Um, well, and, well, and the Democrats, too. It's not just the right. wingers. It is the centrists. But they don't really have a case at all other than what they're mad that Iran helped destroy the Islamic State of, in Iraq and Syria. Or, you know, maybe they want to blame all their problems in Yemen on Iran. That's not much of a cost to spell. I guess they could try to arrange a Gulf of Tonkin type incident. But isn't it so clear who's the bully here and, and who's sitting there trying to stay out of a fight? Well, look, I, you know, I want to make sure that we don't leave out uh, of this discussion, of this analysis. Absolutely, the central political factor in this is that Bolton uh, is, you know, by his background, by his uh, contacts over the years, uh, beholden to and allied closely with the Israeli right-wing Zionists. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is very, very deeply embedded. Uh, this connection is very deeply embedded in this current crisis, because, as I point out in my article in Truth Dig, um, two weeks before a little bit more than two weeks, but about two weeks before Bolton made his uh, uh, White House statement, um, Bolton had a secret meeting. Well, it wasn't secret. Excuse me. It was a, it was a openly uh, announced meeting with the Israeli National Security Advisor um, and uh, had t both Israeli and American teams as assembled. And the Israelis presented their um, Mossad origin uh, set of analyses of possible contingencies having to do with what Iran could do in the Middle East and how, Iran how the United States and Israel should respond to them. So the origins of Bolton's statement have to be viewed in the context of the fact that he had just had this systematic presentation by the Israeli National Security Advisor based on Mossad's analysis, not on intelligence, contrary to the, all the coverage that has been given to Bolton and that statement and uh, supposedly the intelligence that was behind it. It was not intelligence, it was simply their speculation about what the Iranians might do because they were convinced that Iran has to do something because they're under such terrific pressure. And so there is that very deep connection with the Israeli policy, the long-term Netanyahu government policy of trying to maneuver the United States into a military confrontation and indeed, uh, if possible, a U.S. unilateral attack on Iran on the assumption that the Iranians would not dare to uh, attack Israel because then the United States would let Iran have it, you know, systematically. Uh, they've clung to that belief for many years now, and they've been taking actions that would lead to that outcome. And I think this crisis now has to be seen as a product of that Israeli strategy and the fact that Bolton is so enthusiastic about working hand in hand with them. And by the way, just one further point on that. This goes back even further to before Bolton was national security advisor in December 2017, when McMaster was national security advisor, he had what was a secret meeting in the White House with the Israelis, uh, with, with uh, the Israeli national security advisor, again, the same kind of uh, both Israeli and American teams to go over uh, uh, the possible uh, joint Israeli-U.S. Uh, strategy for dealing with Iran. Then they, were, they agreed on four points. They agreed on a joint strategy that had four points. And the fourth point was a common strategy for how to deal with various contingencies uh, in the Middle East involving an Iranian, uh, alleged Iranian move or, or military attack. Hey, y'all, here's the thing. Donate $100 to The Scott Horton Show. And you can get a QR code commodity disc as my gift to you. It's a one ounce silver disc with a QR code on the back. You take a picture of it with your phone and it gives you the instant spot price and lets you know what that silver, that ounce of silver is worth on the market in Federal Reserve notes in real time. It's the future of currency in the past two. Commoditydiscs.com or just go to scotthorton.org slash donate. So just to reiterate this very important point here, you're saying there is no new intelligence about Iran preparing to do anything. In essence, there's a new assessment by the Israelis that if we were them, we would consider doing a thing. And that's about all. That's about all. That's about all. I believe that the evidence is very clear on that, that that there was no there was no new evidence uh, in terms of intelligence, U.S. intelligence community, uh, either raw reporting or uh, the, the uh, intelligence community analysis or assessment that would undergird what uh, we heard from Bolton or what Bolton was saying in that statement, mm -hmm. uh, or, or what has been reported by the media quite irresponsibly, totally irresponsibly, as, as though there was real intelligence behind it. Now, there's a story that came out today that, that claims that Friday afternoon, the, what was it? What was Friday afternoon? the 3rd of May, uh, suddenly there was a, uh, some, somewhere, somewhere 
uh, a, a, a an intelligence analysis uh, appeared that claimed there was all kinds of intelligence that showed that Iran was fixing to have its proxies do something. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, you know, it just doesn't add up. Yeah, of course not. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, and they weren't even specific, like, well, we think that I say al al Haq in Iraq is going to attack or this or that kind of thing. It was just, oh, there's so many things, maybe something mumble mumble, nothing specific, because it would be silly if you said it out loud. Well, yeah, and, and let's let's connect this up with the latest outrage here, which is this business of uh, limpet mines attached to uh, oil tankers outside a UAE port uh, near the entrance to uh, the Gulf. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that the idea that now the United States intelligence suspects that Iran was behind it. Um, without having actually done any investigation or only having begun an investigation at most. Um, and, and this is simply another case of total politicization of the intelligence process. I mean, just on the face of it, that's a pretty weak firing on Fort Sumter to start a war. If you're the Iranians, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sneak around and sabotage a couple of boats. Not spill any oil, but... Right, exactly. Mess I up mean, a radio antenna or some garbage, just, right? Yeah, just to carry that further, I mean, look, uh, we know that at most there was a gash in one or possibly more uh, oil tankers that did not affect its seaworthiness. There was no, you know, no sinking or anything like that. Um, and that, uh, in other words, it was not going to prevent them from going into the Gulf. It was not going to stop or inhibit shipping. All it was going to do was raise the question, hmm, who could have done that now? And, and who has an interest in that at this point? Not the Iranians at all. Yeah. Uh, so well, maybe is the Israelis, but maybe I'm an al-Zawahiri's men who would love nothing more than to see the United States attack Iran, which is a point that nobody ever makes, Gareth, but I think is a good one. Well, absolutely. And, you know, that ties into the point that I made in a tweet yesterday, which is that the last time an oil tanker was hit by any sabotage or attack in that part of the world, that is outside the Gulf, but near UAE, uh, near that port of Fajaira, uh, it was a uh, Al Qaeda, um, uh, Al Qaeda group. Uh, the uh, Abdul Azam, Abdullah Azam brigades. Uh, it was 2010, and uh, they took uh, responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. So, and just like uh, Jake Sullivan wrote to Hillary Clinton in February of 2012, AQ is on our side in Syria, where of course the mission was to check Iranian power by getting rid of their friend Assad. And very same thing here. Yeah, of they, course, they, Ayman al-Zawahiri is sitting back laughing his ass off right now watching this. Right. He would love to have this uh, be blamed on Iran and, and have, uh, you know, be closer to war between Iran and the United States. I mean, that would serve their purposes. They've actually said so publicly um, and in other ways in the past. And it makes perfect sense. So, yeah, there are, there are a number of suspects, but Iran should not be one of them uh, if you're using your your logical uh, cap capabilities. You know, what's interesting, though, is all the dynamics of the deep state politics, this, that, the other thing, where the Daily Beast, which is called that for a good reason. I know it's supposed to be a takeoff on Dickens or something, but it's more like they represent the CIA all day, every day. And, you know, the state itself, the national security state, is in this, I wouldn't say at war with, but they're in the kind of Cold War with the president here. And thank goodness that includes Bolton then. And so they ran this piece saying that multiple intelligence officials say that this is all overblown and that it's inflated intelligence and that we shouldn't make that much of a deal out of it. Um, I know they don't right, run Gareth people. Porter at the Daily Beast, but they ran one article that was worthy of your type of reporting here. I guess as much as they hate Iran, they hate Trump more. So it came out that way. Right, right. I'm, you know, there, there are people who could leak something to the Daily Beast from the Pentagon who would say that, no doubt about it. Yep. And then, and what they said was that um, multiple sources close to the situation said the intelligence was out of proportion 
characterizing the threat as more significant than it actually was, which is a pretty nice way of saying a bunch of trumped up nonsense. So uh, now we're back again to um, the, uh, you know, the overriding narrative and the real facts underlying them and, and how far we are away from any kind of even pretended legit excuse to do anything here, even a claimed excuse to do anything here. Sabotage of a couple of little ships here and there. That's not a good enough Gulf of Tonkin to do anything. It's and, not. But you and know what's so, happening? I mean, what do you think is going to happen here? They're going to end up backing down because the Ayatollah is too smart to take the bait again? Um, they're not going to back down on the, fa- on, the, on the basis that the Ayatollahs are too smart, that's for sure. And, and I would just want to add the, the, the overall point that, you know, we are up against a long history here now of years in which the national security state, um, their, their congressional allies, of course, and their media allies have joined in this chorus of uh, creating a myth about Iran's proxy wars across the Middle East and what a threat that is to peace and security and American interests and our allies' interests. And that is what is, has now taken the place of any precise, specific threat. It's now right. a right. regional threat that has to do with Iran and its proxy wars. And so anytime we talk about this problem, we have to address that fundamental issue. Right, so and it's all George Bush's fault is how you address that. If you don't like the Ayatollah, then you should go back in time and not get rid of Saddam Hussein for him. And if you don't like the Ayatollah, then you should go back in time and not have Barack Obama launch a pro-Al-Qaeda war against Assad in Syria, which only backfired and increased Iran and Hezbollah and Russia's position in that country. Um, and and you shouldn't have paid off Abdullah Saleh to attack the Houthis over and over again until they were powerful enough to drive him out of power or his you know successor anyway and seize power in that country with actually, then, then actually Saleh's help by that time they'd made an alliance but such as you many politics and and then encourage the Saudis uh, to go ahead with their bombing campaign I mean that's the that's the biggest single right. problem uh, in this entire you know cascade of of terrible uh, crimes that were committed that the U.S. national security state is totally complicit in and which are now uh, creating this situation where there are all these multiple opportunities for Bolton and the Israelis to do their damage. Right. Um, and, in other and, words, because the Houthis are now at, in a full-scale war with the Saudis, sometimes they get off a lucky drone strike in Riyadh and this kind of thing. And, right. and, and more way, so lately, uh, which, by the way, you know, all the real experts, including your journalism, uh, but also a lot of other real great experts have uh, written and shown how Iranian support for the Houthis is absolutely minimal. And probably the biggest portion of it is simply the United States of America giving Iran credit for every one of the Houthis successful acts in the war. And so. Um, if you know, just like with Bush in Iraq and Obama in Syria, the Trump government here and Obama started this war, of course, but the Trump government here, they're only empowering Iran and Iran hardly has to lift a finger to do it. You know, they just accept all the credit that the U S gives them in the name of scaremongering about the new Persian empire over there, which America has built for them. And just in this century. And the underlying point is that people who are ready to oppose uh, the U.S. policy that's now being pushed ahead by Bolton and Pompeo uh, must be much more active in, you know, making clear this entire background that that this is a complete. I mean, this is the worst case of the creation of a phony uh, narrative surrounding the Middle East that we've ever that we've ever faced. It's built up over years. And I mean, it makes in a way it makes the the phony narrative about the Iranian nuclear program uh, look uh, puny by comparison. Yeah, it does. Well, it's the one one great talking point we have here. One great fact on our side in this narrative, just like with Iran, is this is literally John Bolton's fault, not just figuratively speaking. He wasn't just 
you know, some hack writing at the National Review. His job was making sure, working for directly for the vice president, making sure that Colin Powell and his man Dick Armitage couldn't stop the march for war in Iraq. I mean, he was an integral player, and including going on TV and lying all day to the American people, too, in the first Bush Jr. administration. Uh, so he did this, just like when he's complaining about Iran has nuclear weapons. Well, he's the one who kicked them right out of the NPT, so... Right. So so it's it's a it's one big uh, mess of of issues that are all connected by precisely the points you're making, which is that, you know, one administration after another has been complicit in actions or or carried out actions directly, which have uh, created situations that Iran had nothing to do with until, you know, they were forced to make decisions to respond uh, the, to to uh, opportunities or threats that were created right. by by these by these actions that the United States and its allies took. Which, by the way, and and this will be the last. I know you got to go too, but this is something that you and I covered, uh, you covered, and I interviewed you about uh, back during Iraq War II as well. Was that yeah, the Iranians took the most cynical advantage they could of George W. Bush. George Bush volunteered to get rid of Saddam for them and put their pets from the Supreme Islamic Council and the Dawa Party in power first and foremost. Hell yes, they took every advantage of that. And they yep. did push, contrary to Muqtad al-Sadr's wishes, for example, the other Shiite uh, leader who had more domestic authority rather than imported, uh, like the Skiri and Dawa guys, that they pushed this whole federalism plan, meaning cleanse and defeat and destroy the Sunni Arabs instead of having more of a nationalist alliance and reconciliation like Sadr wanted. And that was why he constantly denounced them for years. And so Iran absolutely was one of the most malign forces in Iraq War II in alliance with the United States of America. As George W. Bush had the Army and the Marine Corps and the U.S. Air Force doing all of their dirty work for them in cleansing the capital city and creating the you know dominant uh, Shia Stan state there that exists now to this day. And so, yes, right. they're horrible. And yes, 99.99% of it is America's fault. The rest is Iran's. You're, you're absolutely right, and you're one of the very few, if not the only one, who has continued to make that point over and over again. And, and I just want to add one more point to what you've just said, uh, because it brings it up to date in terms of this whole business of blaming Iran for 600 or so deaths of American servicemen in Iraq. What is missing from that is the point that those deaths would not have been uh, anything like 600, had it not been for the fact that Petraeus decided to target those forces on, you know, he took the initiative to target those forces to make them the next uh, enemy of the U.S. military in Iraq. He didn't have to do it because right. they were not seeking a war with the United States. Right. He and he was the blaming the most nationalist Arab Shiite militias, the Sadrists, for being the Iranian cat's paws, when, again, it was the Supreme Islamic Council and their Bada Brigade and those guys who are really Iran's force that Petraeus was allied 100 percent with. And so um, he was really only enhancing Iranian power while attacking the nationalists who wanted to compromise with the Sunnis in the name of fighting Iranian and Shiite sectarianism. And I, if I'm not mistaken, they're also including in that figure all those Americans who died early in the war when they went into Basra and started fighting. And, uh, you know, there were Shia who were in Basra who were who were opposing. Uh, oh, that's the, how they get to 600, right? Is they include the first battle of Najaf in 2004 and stuff like that. Najaf, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. I think that's correct. Which is such garbage. You know, I just wrote a thing uh, for I uh, put on the blog at the Libertarian Institute and at antiwar.com uh, back last week called Did Iran Kill 600 Americans in Iraq War II? Where I remind everybody about the ruse about the so-called EFP bombs and the lie right. that they were all made by Iran and imported into Iraq yeah. and all that stuff. So if people want to look at that, and that, of course, refers back to a lot of your great work from that time. Yeah, so there's lots of there's lots of information there to to use to refute all this. 
the problem is getting it out to enough people that uh, we can make it, we can make a difference. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time on the show as always, Gareth. Glad to be back on the show. Thanks, Scott. All right, you guys. That is Gareth the Great. Gareth Porter is at Truth Out, Truth Dig, and at uh, TAC, the American Conservative. This one is in Truth Dig. It's called Bolton is Spinning Israeli Intelligence, quote unquote, to push for war against Iran. So you like supporting anti-war radio hosts. That makes sense. Uh, Here's how you can do that. Go to scotthorton.org slash donate, and there's all kinds of options to do so and all kinds of different kickbacks at different levels. Of course, take uh, PayPal, Patreon, and all different kinds of digital currencies and all of those sorts of things. And anybody who signs up by way of Patreon or PayPal to donate $5 a month to the show will automatically get keys to the Reddit room, my own private Reddit group that I have. Quite a few members now and lots of fun in there every day. So uh, check out all about that at scotthorton.org donate. And thanks.